Thursday, April 15th, 1920. Payday for the employees of the Slater and Morrill Shoe Company in South Braintree, Massachusetts. In the days before direct deposit, payroll still took the form of a cash payment, delivered to factory employees in envelopes. That morning, a messenger driving a horse and buggy had picked up the payroll for several local factories from a train that had arrived from Boston. He divided it and delivered $15,776.51 to Slater and Morrill paymaster Margaret Mahoney. After placing the money in envelopes, Mahoney locked the payroll in two large steel boxes and gave them to her assistant paymaster, Frederick Parmenter. He and a security guard, Alessandro Berardelli, set out to deliver them to the factory. Mahoney did not accompany them as she sometimes did, nor were any of the other men who often went along for payroll delivery available at the time. Parmenter and Berardelli walked with the boxes. On their way, they stopped to chat with a mechanic for the factory, James Bostock, about a broken pulley. Without warning, two men who had been loitering nearby pulled out guns and charged the group, firing wildly. Their shots struck Parmenter in the back, causing him to fall to the ground. Burradelli too collapsed, and one of the men quickly crouched over him and fired several more shots into his back. The same gunman fired at Bostock, but missed. The gunman grabbed the payroll boxes and quickly threw them into a getaway car that had just pulled up. They joined three other men in the car, described by many witnesses as a large blue or black Buick, and sped off, so fast that witnesses recalled that they took a corner on two wheels. The men continued to fire as they fled. As their getaway car approached a railroad track that had its gate down in preparation for the approach of an oncoming train, the men in the car pointed the guns at the crossing guard. They forced him to raise the rail and then sped across the tracks. Curiously, several minutes later, the men crossed the railroad tracks again, this time throwing tacks out of their car window to stop any pursuers. The South Braintree Police Department, which at the time only had three officers and no automobile, had no hope of catching them. Alessandro Berardelli, a 44-year-old husband and father of two young children who had worked at Slater and Morrill for less than a year, died at the scene. Frederick Parmenter, also a married father of two children and a 20-year employee of the company, was taken to a nearby house, where doctors dug a bullet from his body in an attempt to save his life. But it was no use. Parmenter died the following day. Initially, the police officers called to work the case found themselves short on physical evidence and sorting through a conflicting mass of witness testimony. On April 17th, just two days after the murders, a coroner's inquest was held in which several people who had seen the shooting from the street or the factory nearby were called to testify. Some said Burardelli appeared to know the bandits and had spoken to them. Others gave conflicting accounts of virtually every detail of the getaway car and the bandits' appearances. The witnesses agreed that everything had happened so fast that it was hard for them to keep the details straight. One witness even testified that he saw two cars, not one. Soon enough, however, police found themselves with two promising leads. One came the same day of the inquest, when two men riding horses in the woods discovered an abandoned, dusty Buick with stolen plates. Although no one initially remarked on there being bullet holes in the car, police would later state that they discovered one in the door. That, plus the fact that there were tracks of another car near the abandoned vehicle, made them suspect that they had discovered the getaway car. They quickly set about fingerprinting it. The second lead came from Michael Stewart, the chief of police in nearby Bridgewater, Massachusetts. Chief Stewart, as it happened, had his own unsolved robbery to deal with, and one that seemed to him to be eerily similar to the crime in South Braintree. Less than four months earlier, on Christmas Eve of 1919, four men had attempted to rob a Bridgewater shoe factory's payroll truck. Although they had exchanged gunfire with a security guard, no one was injured, and the robbery attempt failed. Stewart, who had no clear suspects for the crime at the time, nevertheless suspected that it had been committed by foreign radicals, possibly Russians or Italians who were seeking money to fund their activities. Coincidentally, on the day after the South Braintree killings, 
Stewart had sent an officer to investigate a Bridgewater man named Ferruccio Coacci, an Italian anarchist who had recently been employed at Slater and Morrill. Two years earlier, Coacci had been arrested following a police raid on the offices of an anarchist newspaper published by Luigi Galliani, a radical anarcho-communist who supported the use of violence to accomplish political ends. At the time of his arrest, Coacci had posted bond and had been released. In April of 1920, however, his bond was set to expire. Coacci faced deportation under the Anarchist Exclusion Act of 1918, a law that placed restrictions on foreign radicals' presence in the United States. Coachi had requested an extension to his bond on the grounds that he was caring for his sick wife. When the officer arrived to check on him on April 16th, however, he found Coachi's wife in good health and Coachi himself packing a trunk. Coachi told the officer that he did not intend to contest his deportation. Two days later, he was placed on a boat back to Italy. When the officer had initially come to see Koachi, the matter had seemed completely unrelated to the events in South Braintree. When Chief Stewart heard about what had happened at the Koachi house, however, he became immediately suspicious. Why would a man who had resisted deportation suddenly be willing to leave just a day after a deadly shooting? To Stewart, who already suspected that foreign radicals were behind the payroll robberies, the timing seemed too coincidental. Furthering his suspicion was the fact that Coachi lived with another Italian anarchist, Mario Buda, a.k.a. Mike Boda, who kept a Buick in the shed in the back of his house. When Stewart and the state police had investigated the Bridgewater robbery, Pinkerton detectives who were also placed on the case had passed on to them a tip. An Italian man in Boston had been bragging about knowing the Bridgewater bandits and even acting as their getaway driver. Massachusetts State Police Superintendent H.J. Murray, upon hearing about this, had the man tailed. On December 30th, 1919, the man's tails had overheard him saying something interesting. He claimed that the Bridgewater bandits were Italian anarchists, that they kept their car in a shack outside of town, and that after the botched robbery they had abandoned the car and taken a trolley to Quincy. Chief Stewart had been informed of this tip, and he thought of it immediately when he heard from his officer that Buddha kept a Buick in the shed behind his house. After the stolen Buick allegedly used in the South Braintree robbery showed up in the woods less than two miles away from the Kowachi and Buddha house, Stewart suspected that he had found the men responsible for both crimes. When he visited the Buddha house to see it for himself, he learned that the overland that Buddha kept in the shed was at a garage for work. Stewart, intent on finding incriminating evidence, visited the house twice more. By the third time, Buddha was gone, and so was all the furniture. Stewart, now even more convinced of Buddha's involvement, located the garage that had his car and asked the owner to find an excuse not to release it if anybody came by to pick it up. Instead, the mechanic was to call the police immediately. Soon enough, Buddha did come to pick up the car. On the night of May 5th, he and three associates arrived at the mechanic shop. Finding it already closed, the men knocked on the door of the garage owner's house next door. The owner's wife stalled the men by telling them that the garage could not release the car to them because it didn't have the proper 1920 license plate. The men initially protested, but then decided to leave and come back for the car the following day. Buddha and his friend, Ricardo Orsiani, had arrived together on a motorcycle, and they left the same way. The other two men went to catch the streetcar. The shop owner's wife wasted no time in calling the police. When they got the call, detectives from South Braintree phoned ahead to alert officers in Brockton to arrest the men who were headed their way on the streetcar. Brockton officers boarded the car and found the men who matched the woman's description. They were two Italian immigrants who had arrived in the United States coincidentally the same year, 1908. The men were Nicola Sacco, a married father who worked in a shoe factory as an edger and night watchman, and Bartolomeo Vanzetti, who sold fish from a handcart. The officers informed Sacco and Vanzetti that they were under arrest for being, quote, suspicious characters. 
Upon searching the men, the officers found a loaded 38 caliber revolver in Vanzetti's pocket, along with some shotgun shells. They initially missed, but eventually discovered a loaded 32 caliber Colt semi-automatic tucked into Sacco's waistband. Both men also had additional ammunition on them. Sacco would later explain that he got in the habit of being armed in his job as a night watchman. Vanzetti would tell officers that he carried a gun because he was worried about his safety. Police placed Sacco and Vanzetti in separate cells in the Brockton police station and interrogated them. Neither man initially asked for an attorney because they did not know that they had the right to one, and in the days before Miranda warnings were required, they weren't told. When Sacco did eventually ask the DA for an attorney, his request was ignored. Interestingly, although the police had arrested the men as murder suspects, their initial questions did not mention the Braintree or the Bridgewater incidents. Instead, they focused on whether Sacco and Vanzetti knew Buddha, and whether they had anarchist sympathies or were members of any anarchist organizations. In response to these questions, Sacco and Vanzetti denied knowing Buddha. They also denied being anarchists. Both statements, as it turned out, were lies. Although he himself was a well-paid, skilled laborer, Nicola Nick Sacco had developed sympathies with the radical elements in the labor movement by 1912. He donated to and supported several strikes that took place among Massachusetts factory workers in the 1910s, many of which were led by a radical labor organization called the International Workers of the World. The IWW advocated not just better conditions for workers, but also the overthrow of capitalism as a whole. Sacco sympathized with this goal and became attracted to the anarcho-communist activism of Italian anarchist Luigi Galliani, who also supported the strikes. Galliani believed that the overthrow of capitalism and the state would usher in an era of human freedom and cooperation. Sacco subscribed to Galliani's newspaper, the same one that had led to the arrest of Coachi in 1918. So did Vanzetti, whose own experiences with trying to find work in the United States had been frustrating enough to convince him that the world was rigged against laborers. Vanzetti would later recall, Arriving in America, I underwent all the sufferings, the delusions, and the privation that come inevitably to one who lands at the age of 20, ignorant of life, and something of a dreamer. Here I saw all the brutalities of life, all the injustice, the corruption, in which humanity struggles tragically. Vanzetti's dissatisfaction with the state of labor in the United States had prompted him to participate in a 1916 strike by workers at the Plymouth Cordage Company, where a housemate of his was employed. Vanzetti, like Sacco, embraced anarcho-communist ideologies. Sacco and Vanzetti's lies about their political sympathies and their acquaintance with Buddha confirmed the police and district attorney's suspicions regarding their guilt. The men were initially held on weapons charges, but soon enough police arrested Ricardo Orsiani as well, though Mario Buda managed to escape their grasp. The police hoped to charge all three suspects with the Bridgewater robbery, but Orsiani and Sacco could both prove that they were at work the day it happened. Vanzetti, who was self-employed as the operator of a fish cart, couldn't establish via time card or testimony from a boss that he had been at work. The police charged him with the Bridgewater crime. Then, because Sacco had taken April 15th off of work, police charged both him and Vanzetti with the South Braintree murders. The police's theory was that the two had taken the money to fund their subversive activities and given it to Kawachi. Notably, when Italian officials searched Kawachi upon his arrival in port, though, they found him carrying no cash. The over $15,000 that was taken in the robbery was never found. During Vanzetti's trial for the Bridgewater robbery, several eyewitnesses placed him at the scene. Meanwhile, over a dozen Italian witnesses swore that he had been delivering eels, a traditional Italian Christmas meal, to them on the day of the robbery. The timing of the deliveries, if the witnesses were telling the truth, would have made it impossible for Vanzetti to have committed the crime. The prosecution, however, alleged that the witnesses were mistaken or perhaps lying to defend their countrymen. Jurors in the case were convinced of Vanzetti's guilt, although they weren't initially sure which charge to convict him on, assault or assault with intent to murder. 
The jurors came up with their own solution to this conundrum. They had been presented with shotgun shells that had been found on Vanzetti's person upon his arrest in Brockton over four months after the Bridgewater robbery. Jurors opened the shotgun shells to see if they contained birdshot or the more deadly and heavier buckshot. Upon discovering that the shells contained buckshot, the jury decided to convict Vanzetti of assault with intent to murder. Later, a juror who had saved one of the shells as a souvenir ran into Judge Webster Thayer in a furniture store and told him what had happened. Thayer told the prosecutor in the case, who confiscated the shell and told the juror to keep quiet, as jurors were not supposed to use evidence not presented in open court to decide their verdicts. Vanzetti's conviction earned him a long prison sentence, but it would be the next trial, that of Sacco and Vanzetti for the South Braintree murders, that would capture the nation's and indeed the world's attention. During the nearly six years that passed between Sacco and Vanzetti's 1921 conviction for the murders and their eventual execution by electric chair in 1927, their case would attract the attention of local and national newspapers, influential foreign leaders, including Benito Mussolini, and virtually every famous writer and intellectual in 1920s America. Advocates of the men's innocence, including several prominent social and anarchist leaders, formed a Sacco Vanzetti defense committee to raise money for their men's legal representation. They fought fierce legal and political battles with people who believed firmly in the men's guilt. When Sacco and Vanzetti were executed in 1927, thousands of people marched in their funeral procession in Boston, and people in cities around the world turned out to protest their executions sometimes violently. Their case was labeled at the time as the crime of the century, and it continues to attract the attention of journalists, musicians, and true crime enthusiasts even today. But why? Why did the trial of two men accused of committing robbery and murder in an industrial Massachusetts town become the cause celeb of its time? What social issues made the crime and the subsequent trial such a sensation and why does it continue to be a subject of study and debate? Moreover, were Sacco and Vanzetti victims of the justice system, cold-blooded killers, or perhaps both? These are the questions you'll address in this module.